Islam in Bible Prophecy, and we've also sort of subtitled it, Israel and the Purpose of God. And um, as we look at what's going on in the world around us, it's pretty exciting to see the events that have been taking place over the last little while. And um, we're going to begin our sessions together with just a, a little bit of a review of some of the importance of prophecy in our daily walk because we can get excited about the things that have been written before for our learning upon whom the end of the world has come. We have the passage given to us in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. We're told here by Paul, knowing the time, it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And prophecy really has been given to to help wake us out of the sleep, really, that we can get into with the events that are going on in our our daily lives. And knowing the time, knowing the imminence of the Lord's return, it helps us to prepare ourselves. So we read in Matthew chapter 13, the command of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples is, Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes, at even or midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So every single one of us then has a personal responsibility to be watching because we don't know the day or the hour when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Although as he tells his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 and down to verse 9 that they will understand later on the time and the season. Now, we read in First pa- or Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 that we haven't followed, says the Apostle Peter, cunningly devised fables. These weren't a bunch of stories and a bunch of made-up things when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we were there in the mount and we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And the same is true, he says, for us. We're not just following a bunch of stories, but we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto, he says, you do well that you take heed as to unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So the word of prophecy is sure. It's more sure than it was for them standing in the mount with the Lord Jesus Christ and hearing the voice from heaven. And it's a light that shines in a dark place. And so we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, And at verse 1, of the times and seasons, brethren, he says, you've got no need that I write unto you, but yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But he goes on to tell us, watch you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of the light, the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So, When we think about that duty we have to be awake and to be watching and to be sober, our brother John Thomas, in writing the book Help Us Israel, the very beginning of it, tells us that, you know, there's a reason why we should look into these things. He says, the Lord has revealed what is to come to pass in these latter days. Now, that's 170 years ago, so we're even more into the latter days now. It is both our duty and privilege to make ourselves acquainted with it, that our faith may grow and be strengthened, that our affections be detached from the fleeting present and set more firmly on things to come, and that our minds may be fortified against error, and that we may be prepared to meet the Lord as those who have kept their garments and not be put to shame. It is our own fault if we are not light in the Lord. He has plainly set before us what is happening in our day and what is yet to occur. So that's somebody writing 117, 70 years ago telling us, look, we got to pay attention. And really what he's saying is like prophecy is like smelling salts for our spiritual minds, right? If you remember smelling salts, you know, the, the boxers in the ring and the one would knock the other one out and they'd get the smelling salt put under his nose and it'd wake him up, right? And that's what prophecy's for. It's to wake us up. When we get lulled to sleep or when we're drifting off, it's there to wake us up from the, the foggy haze that's created by the deceitful pleasures in the world around us. Now, we're going to begin diving right into the book of Revelation. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapters 8 and 9, because this is really where we're going to spend our time um, over the next uh, little while. Revelation chapters 8 and 9 really form the basis of our, our conversation together, and they are the trumpets. And we're not going to deal with the first four trumpets in any uh, depth 
Um, but that is really the context of what we're looking at. It's the trumpets, basically, that are the judgments upon the, uh, the Christian Roman Empire. So just to give ourselves a little bit of perspective uh, when we look at this, um, what we want to realize is where we're plugging into in the grand prophetic scheme. So if we go to Daniel in our minds and just say, okay, in Daniel, we have in chapter 2, of course, the image, right? The, the image of Daniel chapter 2, you've got the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, and the, the legs of iron and the feet, part of iron and part of clay. Well, in Daniel chapter 7, he breaks those down into their composite beasts that really sort of relate to them. So you have the lion, which is Babylon in, uh, in Daniel chapter 7, and then you have the Medo-Persian bear, the Greek leopard, and finally you have the, the Roman fourth beast, or the great red dragon, as we're going to see, that it's called in the book of Revelation. So that's the grand scheme going from Daniel's time, 2,600 years ago, all the way through to our time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to smite that image on the feet. For our intents and purposes, we're really zeroing in on the very last of those phases in the book of, um, uh, the book of Daniel, and that is the Roman uh, great red beast that we read about with the ten horns. Now, of course, Daniel was a book that was sealed up. At the end of it, we're right, we read in Daniel chapter 12 and verses 7 through 10, he says, I heard, but I didn't understand, and he asked his Lord for understanding, and he says, go thy way, Daniel, the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then he says, well, the wise in the time of the end are going to understand. So Daniel goes his way and the words are sealed up. But then when we jump through the book of Revelation, they're unsealed in chapter 5, and we read there that the line of the tribe of Judah unseals them, and we have this host of beasts then that basically are depicted for us. And they're all phases of that fourth beast that Daniel was to look at. You have the, the great red dragon um, in chapter 12, which is symbol of the pagan Roman Empire. The Christian Roman Empire is depicted in chapter 13 as the sea beast, followed by the Holy Roman Empire in chapter 13, the latter half of the chapter. And finally, we have the, the European system of today, which is depicted by the harlot who rides that beast. And of course, I believe you were looking at last weekend uh, that, that harlot system in, uh, in Bible prophecy. So again, what we're looking at really in the, the time period that we're first jumping into is this area of the, the Christian Roman Empire. Because upon every one of those beast systems, there was going to be a series of judgments that would be poured out. So when you look at Revelation, you have the, the dragon, and there are the judgments, which are called the seals, that are placed upon the pagan dragon. Then you have the trumpets that are divided into two parts that go upon the Christian Roman Empire, and then the vials that are dealing with the, the, the um, judgments upon the Holy Roman Empire, and then finally the thunders, which are sealed up, which are judgments upon Catholic Europe. Now when we look at these, the ones again that we're focusing on at first, we're going to be looking at some of the vials as well, um, but we're first looking at it, these, these thunder, or sorry, these, these um, trumpet judgments. The first four are on the Western Roman Empire, because the empire divided into two, and the second two are on the Eastern Roman Empire, and they're really where we're going to spend our time. But just to mention them, the first four judgments on Western Rome, really you, you have them laid out for us. We have um, the, uh, the first judgment, which would be the Visigoths, which is under Alaric. Then along come the, the Vandals, which is Genseric, um, the Huns under Attila, and finally you have the, the other Goths under uh, Odoacer. And between these four empires, they basically ravage the western side of the Roman Empire, and the last of them uh, basically extinguishes it. It puts an end to the Roman Empire completely in the west. But in the meantime, in the east, there is still the Byzantine Empire that's alive and doing relatively well. And so between these, these four different groups and the other ones associated with them, Europe is divided up into a series of different little states, um, and the Roman Empire is, of course, done away with. And you can see here on the right-hand side that you have the Roman Empire still in existence, and that is the Byzantine Empire that is in the east that is still alive. So we're diving in, first of all, then, in our narrative that we're going to spend some time on, into the judgments upon that Eastern Roman Empire, which is the fifth trumpet, which comes to us in Revelation chapter 9. 
So that's really where we're going to begin our thoughts together. The fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9. And as we read through this, this really connects us with our subject because we're talking about Islam in Bible prophecy. Well, the Bible's descriptions of Islam are absolutely phenomenal. In fact, they're so accurate that some people have sort of suggested that, you know, it's just too, too uncannily accurate to be true. But we just, we're going to go through and have a look and see this. So we come into Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. We're introduced to the fifth angel sounding his trumpet. And he sees a star fall from heaven to the earth. And he says there um, that this, to him is given, to the star is given a key to this bottomless pit. So we have the star angel that descends from heaven to earth. And he's given this key, which of course is a symbol of power to this bottomless pit. And this bottomless pit, of course, opens up, and uh, that bottomless pit is going to be out of which comes this smoke, and out of the pit a great furnace, and the sun and the air are darkened by the smoke of the, fit, the pit. So the key, a symbol of power, shows the idea he's given authority to change the heavens, right? Because the sun and the moon are going to be darkened. So in biblical symbolic language, give hero heavens and hero earth, the heavens and the earth refer to uh, the, the rulership and the peoples ruled over. Revelation 3 verse 7, the Lord Jesus Christ is given the key of David. It's, it's a symbol of power. And this bottomless pit that opens up, out of it is going to come all of these judgments. Judgments of Almighty God. We think of this idea of, of a furnace, and um, just a couple of thoughts of passages. Deuteronomy 29:20, 20, the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against men. We read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 of flaming fire and vengeance that's going to come against those who know not God. And in Isaiah 50 or 66, we read about fire and anger and fury and flames of fire and a sword coming against, uh, well, when Yahweh pleads with men. And the result is that the sun and the moon are going to be darkened. And so this is what happens out of this pit, though. We read that there come out locusts upon the earth, and unto them is given power. So they have scor they, their tails are like scorpions. And um, they have this power as the scorpions of the earth. Now, the interesting thing about locusts, if you to take your concordance and to look it up, it's the Strong's number 200. The word is acris, and it simply means a swarm of locusts. By definition, spread by the winds from Arabia into Palestine, having devastated that country, migrated to regions farther north until they perished by falling into the sea. So it tells you that the locusts, are a great swath of these little creatures that come from the area of Arabia. So in biblical language then, we should be looking for a power that would arise out of the area of Arabia. And of course, that is exactly what we're going to see. So let's just drill down on some of the elements then. We have, first of all, this king, a king over the locusts, which is an anomaly, really, when you read about this. So this is Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11. We read there, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Greek tongue is Abaddon, or in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. And of course, that name means the destroyer, right? He is the destroying angel. And we used to call my daughter's room, you know, the pit of the abyss where Abaddon reigned because it looked like it had been destroyed. But this is the idea. This is this, the destroying angel that goes forward from this point. But notice that they have a king over them. Well, why is that an anomaly? Well, because we read in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27 that the locusts have no king. Yet, he says, they go forth, all of them, by bands. So, kingless locusts have a king reigning over them. So, this group that is to appear from the area of Arabia is to have a king. And the word there is Basilius which means the leader of a people, a prince, a commander, a lord of the land, a king, a hereditary leader of their own race. And so this destroying angel is to be an hereditary leader of the race of the peoples that are going to rise up out of the area of Arabia. Now, if we think about Arabia, we'll say, well, who inhabited the area of Arabia? Well, of course, we know that that's where Abraham's son Ishmael went. Genesis chapter 16, we read there the time period of Ishmael 
And this is what is said about him. The angel of the Lord said unto her, this is to Hagar, Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son. This is when she'd run away. And you're going to call his name Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thine affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So that's the description of Ishmael. He's not exactly going to be somebody who's going to work well with others, you could say, if he were doing a report card. You know, does not work well with others in class, uh, constantly fighting. Um, this is the description that's given of Ishmael. However, in chapter 21, once he's cast out, we do read about him. He, the angel comes to her again and says, Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation, God says. And God opens her eyes, and she sees the well, and of course she gives him to drink. And verse 20, God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt, which of course makes sense because that's where she's from. So this is the great nation that would come out of the area of Arabia that would be a mix of peoples that usually don't get along together, but are somehow going to be led by this king. Well, then we read here that there is this star element that comes to this whole thing, which is quite fascinating. There was to be a star that would fall from heaven. Remember the words of Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. Right? So that is the case of what takes place. A star falls from heaven to the earth, and then there's going to be all these judgments that follow. Well, this helps us in our identification of who this power might be. These judgments, of course, are going to be against the Roman Empire. And the star of the period, this destroying angel, is the person Muhammad. Now, if you think of Mecca, and it's been in the news recently because there was a great big uh, tragedy that happened in this place where some crane fell over and, and crushed a bunch of people. But you've got to ask, well, what are all these people doing in Mecca? Well, they're wandering around and around, uh, this huge group is wandering around this shrine to the Kaaba. And the Kaaba is the cube, is what it means in Arabic, which is a black stone, which is believed to have been a meteorite that fell from heaven. It was worshipped by the pagan Arabs. They found the stone after it had fallen. They collected it. They took it to this place, and they built this shrine around it. And they set up 360 idols circling it, and they would walk around it seven times known, in something known as the, uh, the tawaf, which was the ritual circumambulations that traced the direction of the sun. And Muhammad was born in the city and raised there by his uncle, Hashim, uh, because his father and his mother had died. And um, he actually kept this one piece of the pagan idolatry, and that stone is what is at the center of this whole thing that's going on here. They walk around still seven times worshiping this stone. He kind of did what the Catholics did because this was such a popular item, he couldn't get rid of it. So instead of getting rid of it, he just said, we need to rename this, rebrand it, I guess you could say. And that's what he did. He rebranded it and he said, hey, this stone is the last remaining piece of the altar that Abraham built with his son Ishmael. So we're going to reverence it. That's what this whole thing in Mecca is all about. But it's actually the worship of the meteor that fell from heaven, which is really interesting when you look at Revelation chapter 9. So let's just consider Muhammad for a moment and just get a little bit of background. Because sometimes as Christadelphians, you know, we talk about other religions, but we don't really understand what they're about. And, and you talk to somebody who's from the Islamic faith, you really don't know what you're talking about. We might be able to wrangle with the Baptists or, or the Catholics or whatever, because some of us have come from that background. But when it comes to Islam, that's a little bit more difficult sometimes. Well, this is the story of Muhammad and the visions of the cave of Hira. So there's the, the picture of the cave today. It's still uh, ad, um, admired by the Muslims. So Muhammad basically took a hike out to the Hira uh, cave, Mount Hira, three miles from Mecca, and spent uh, several days and nights in meditation there. And this is about when he's 40 years old. He claims to have had a vision. He says, while I was asleep, the angel Gabriel of all people appeared to me and said, read, Muhammad. 
which is interesting because Muhammad's actually illiterate. So he read aloud and he says, he departed from me at last, I woke from my sleep, and it was as though these words were written on my heart. So I went forth uh, when I was in mid, it was midday on the mountain, I heard the voice of the, uh, from heaven saying, oh Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah, I am Gabriel, raise your head towards heaven and see, and lo, Gabriel in the form of a man with the feet, uh, with his feet, evenly sit on the rim of the sky, was saying, O Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah, and I am Gabriel. Kind of reminds you of Joseph Smith and the, the golden plates. It's kind of along that same lines. But here we have where Muhammad is commissioned, according to the Quran, uh, to go forth and to, uh, to speak this new religion. And that's exactly what Muhammad does. He went about reciting the words of, the, of, of Allah to his converts. Now the words... The reciting is where you get the word Quran, because Quran comes from the word Qara, which simply means to recite. So the Quran is the recitings of Muhammad. And Muhammad, though, was a monotheistic, uh, his religion was monotheistic, as opposed to all the, the Arabs in the area right now. Remember, they had 360 idols all the way around. Well, he's got one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And Islam... The word itself means to surrender or to submit. So the idea was every Muslim, which is just the Arabic use of the word Islam in a different form, was to submit to the one God Allah and Muhammad, his prophet. So somebody who is a Muslim is a submitter. They submit to Allah and they submit to Muhammad and they submit, of course, to this idea of one God. Well, the legend goes on to speak about Muhammad falling asleep and being transported from Mecca to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And from here, a flying horse, Al-Barak, was, uh, was to take Muhammad to heaven where he had a meeting with Jesus, Moses, and Abraham. That's why the Muslims revere the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, because it's from here that Muhammad left and went to heaven to meet Jesus, Abraham, and Moses. It's the third holiest site in Islam. The irony is, Muhammad never went there. There was no flying horse that took him there, but that's what's believed. So all this, you know, fuss about Islam and the Temple Mount, it's their holy site. He was never even there, but that's what they tell you. Um, but nonetheless, there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and of course, a little bit of rebranding had to go on, a little rewriting of Genesis. So the Dome of the Rock, which is on the same place, we were there in June to walk by this. Um, Muhammad, you see, in the Quran, it doesn't mention who was sacrificed at that rock. So they turn around, they change the story, and they say, well, actually, it wasn't Isaac, it was Ishmael. So that's why they built this, uh, this uh, great site here at the Dome of the Rock. Um, and, of course, then Muhammad went on his mission to break the idols. He was a polytheist, believed in, or he wasn't a polytheist, he was a, a monotheist, believed in one god, but he went and destroyed all the idols of the pagan Arabs around. And, of course, they didn't really like that too much. So he had to flee for his life, and he fled from a Mecca to a place called Medina, and this is the year 622 A.D., and uh, his flight was called the uh, Hijra, uh, or Hijra, which, of course, every Muslim is then asked to make uh, hijjah um, into, uh, to Mecca once in their lifetime at least. So um, that's where this all began. So you can go there today to Medina, and uh, he created a theocracy there. He created the uh, constitution of Medina, and um, you can see his staff and coat and, and hat that are still there today, uh, kind of similar to sort of Christian relic worship. This is sort of the same thing in a different dress or turban or whatever you want to call it. So um, the story goes on, of course, the great battle of Badira, uh, Badir in 623, where the rulers of Mecca ticked off at Muhammad for breaking all their idols, sent to destroy him an army of 900 uh, soldiers to attack Muhammad and his 300. And of course, they were, they were beaten. And after this, Muhammad proclaimed a fast that would uh, celebrate this battle of Badira or Badira, which is Ramadan. So you've heard of Ramadan, that's where it comes from, one of the seven or the five pillars of Islam. Well, he would then turn around and head back to Medina, um, and he would then fight there with 10,000 who came from Mecca. And um, during this battle, he basically says, at last the fire is kindled in the furnace. 
he would squash this whole group and he would become the supreme ruler in the Arabian Peninsula. And so the Mohammedan Empire and the, and the religion of, of Islam began at this place. And it's interesting he uses the word furnace there, the fire is kindled in the furnace, because that is exactly the way the scriptures describe it. The glowing embers, so to speak, now in the heat of this furnace are going to bring forth smoke. So we read in Revelation chapter 9, verse 2, when he opened the bottomless pit, smoke arose out of the pit, as it was of a great furnace, the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So this army of Bedouin uh, that he had organized, uh, when he finally dies in three or 632, they all come out of this area and they decide, okay, we're going to push this, this uh, religion forward and we're going to take over the rest of the area around us. And so off they go and um, there was a, a great battle um, from Mecca um, that was taken in 630 and um, they smashed all the rest of the, the idols and shrines except for the Kaaba. They kept that and uh, when Muhammad died, uh, they buried him in this place called uh, Medina, uh, which you've probably heard about, the tomb of the prophet in 632 when he's 62 years old. So it's the second holiest site of Islam, and that's where his grave is. So when we just think about him, like how this whole process started off, he succeeded in uniting the, the Bedouin and the Arab tribes down in the south. He established the first caliphate, a system whereby the warring factions were ruled under one commander. They had a king over them. And he began to destroy pagan worship and established a monotheistic religion called Islam, which contained the message that Muslims were to command or commanded to take out to the whole world around. And of course, they had their Quran, which was penned, they believe, by Allah, delivered to Muhammad verbally by Gabriel, and then written down by one of Muhammad's uh, successors, in these surahs or these writings by Uthman, the third uh, caliph in about 652 AD. So this is sort of where this whole thing began. So out of this area then would come these swarms. Swarms were told of locusts. Now we just want to look at locusts for a moment. Um, in Joel, there's great descriptions of locusts, just from a biblical perspective. It talks about a parma worm coming along, what it leaves, the locust is going to eat, and then what it leaves, the canker worm is going to eat, and then what it leaves, the caterpillar is going to eat. He says, a nation is going to come upon the land strong without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, have to cheek like the teeth of a great lion, and it's going to make bare and clear this whole area off. So that's the way Joel describes what locusts do and kind of uses that same symbology to talk about Gentiles coming on the land of Israel. That's a different time period, but you get the idea. So there are different stages of locusts. We learn all about this in biology class. There's the palmer worm, uh, gazam, which it is, or the nymph, as we would perhaps call it. He's the first of the series. That's followed by the caterpillar. So this is the locust that hasn't got wings yet. They just crawl around. It's the wingless larvae. And then the canker worm, which has the, the sort of immature wings. And then finally, the locust itself, which is the araba, is that actually the word is. And uh, they're the ones who swarm and multiply. And of course, they would come across the land. In the Bible, it uses this symbol several times. It's used in the Midianites in Judges chapter 6. It talks about the Midianites coming up and encamping against the children of Israel and destroying the increase of the earth. And it says that they came like grasshoppers for multitude. So interesting that it's the Midianites from the south, but they were to come from the area of Arabia, invade Israel during Gideon's time, and devour everything, destroy it all. Joel also talks about this, as we've looked at, and he describes this people coming like locusts, but they're like a big black cloud, he says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 2. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there have not been ever like it, neither shall be any more after it, even the years of many generations. So this is the great cloud of invaders that would come, and he tells us what they would do. Um, he says there in verse 3 that like a fire devouring before them and behind them, the flame's going to burn, the land is like the Garden of Eden ahead of them, but once they pass by, it's a desolate wilderness and nothing's going to escape. What are they like? Well, he uses the same words of Revelation. The appearance of them is like the appearance of horses and horsemen. They're going to run like that. 
The sound is going to be like the noise of chariots, and they're going to run across the tops of the mountains, and the noise is going to be like that, like a flame of fire that devours stubble. And so that's the way the Bible describes it. And interestingly, early explorers to the Middle East, um, this man, uh, Guillaume Ol Olivier, or whatever it is, my French is never that good, um, he is traveling around the Ottoman Empire in the 1700s, and he says, with a burning sound of, of wind, the Syrian winds, there comes this from the interior of Arabia, from the southern parts of Persia, clouds of locusts whose ravage, who ravage these countries are grievous, whose ravage to these countries are grievous, and nearly as sudden as those as the heaviest hail on Europe. We witnessed it twice. It's difficult to express the effect produced on us by the sight of the whole atmosphere, filled on all sides to a great height with an innumerable company of these insects, whose flight is slow and uniform, and whose night noise resembles that of rain, the sky was darkened, the light of the sun was considerably wakened, or weakened, sorry. In a moment, the traces of the houses, the streets, and all the fields were covered by these insects. And in two days, they had nearly devoured all the leaves of the plants. So they come along and they just wipe everything out. So that's kind of a little bit of the biblical background to the language that's used. But let's just drill down now, if you've got your Bibles open, to Revelation chapter 9, because it gives us some of the details there of these creatures themselves. He says in verse 7, The shapes of the locusts are like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads was it were crowns of gold. Their faces are like the faces of men. They have the hair of women, and their teeth are as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and as many horses running to battle. Now, we've heard some of those things before, but here we have this description that's given of these locusts. And it's interesting, Jeremiah points out that they appoint a captain against her and cause the horse to come up as the rough caterpillar. So he likens the caterpillar, which is the locust, to these horses. And we'll read in the dictionaries that the head of the locust resembles the horse. The Italians call the locust a cavalette, uh, a little horse. So this is the, the language of scripture, and what is going to burst onto the scene is this peculiar looking creature. You say, well, what exactly does all this mean? Well, here's the interesting thing. It says that they were like horses prepared to battle. Well, that tells you that their army is an army of cavalry. The armies of Islam were mounted cavalry. That's how they moved so quickly uh, from place to place. They were to have on their heads crowns of gold. Well, one of the uh, sayings, the surahs of the Quran, was that they were to wear the golden turban, right? They had to wear a golden turban upon their head. They had the faces of men. They weren't supposed to cut their beards, and so that's why you have racial profiling going on. Um, and they had the hair, which was like the hair of women, because they allowed it to grow very long. And so they had the hair of women, and their followers do the same today. But their teeth were like the teeth of lions. Now, we've already seen in the words of Joel and, and of, um, of uh, Judges how that they would come and they would strip the land with these teeth. But there's also another meaning tied into it as well. One of the great leaders of Islam in the early stages uh, who followed under Muhammad is this man here. He's called Ali, the Lion of Allah, the Lion of God. And he had a ferocious mindset. When Muhammad said, who will be my vizier or my, my lieutenant? He turns around and says, O prophet, I will be thy vizier. I am the man. Whoever rises against thee, I will dash out his teeth, tear out his eyes, rip his legs, or break his legs, rip up his belly. O prophet, I will be your vizier or lieutenant. So a pretty gory sounding guy. Um, but he was called the Lion of Allah. And they had breastplates of iron. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 9, they had breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots. When so the Quran, they're told, God has given you coats of mail to defend you in, their, in your wars. So they had to wear coats of mail, breastplates of iron. Revelation chapter 9, verse 5, they had torment in their, their tails. It's the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. Uh, verse 10, they had tails like the scorpions, and there are stings in their tails. We're not going to read all of this because it's really long, but um, they were the first ones to introduce this idea of Greek fire into um, this whole area. It was during one of Muhammad's last campaigns in 632. They picked up this idea of the Greek fire, and it was used from then on 
uh, and in Baghdad and so on and so forth. So it's this idea of towing along a catapult with this, this naphtha um, substance and they would launch this off, this Greek fire, and of course people had never seen anything like this before. It was the first real munitions uh, of this kind that was used on the battlefield in the, in the same way. So what was the mission though of these people? So this is Islam. Here it is, it's in Bible prophecy. What was its role? What was it supposed to do? Well, we read in Revelation chapter 9, and at verse 4, it was commanded unto them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, that's a whole other subject altogether, the seal of God. There is two things that run parallel in the book of Revelation. There's the mark of the beast, which was in the forehead, and there's the seal of God that was in the forehead. The mark of the beast is the teachings of Catholicism and all that went with it. The seal of God is the teachings of the Father and all that goes with it. Both of them have characteristics and both of them have works that will be done. If you follow the teachings of the, the mark of the beast, so to speak, your works are going to be destruction, pillage, and so on and so forth. If you're going to follow the law of God, love, joy, peace, and all these kinds of things. Well, this is what Muhammad had to say. So actually this is Abu Bakr, he's the guy up the top there. He's the uh, first successor to Muhammad, so after Muhammad dies, he reigns a very short period of time, but he had something very interesting to say. At first, you see, he fought against the Arabs, he rebelled against uh, Muhammad in what was called the Wars of the Apostasy, but once he got rid of them, he's like, all right, you know, we got all this army together, what are we going to do? Let's go conquer somebody. So he decided to go and attack the Byzantine Empire. And this is what he said. Remember, you were always in the presence of God on the verge of death and in assurance of judgment and the hope of paradise. Not much has changed there, going to heaven with all your, your virgins and whatever else. Uh, avoid injustice and oppression. Let your, not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you need to eat. So don't destroy those things. But what are you supposed to do? You will find another sort of people who belong to the synagogue of Satan, who have shaven crowns, monks that is. Be sure to cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either convert or pay tribute. So who were they to attack? Those who had the mark of the beast. Those who followed the Catholic faith. And other people they're to leave alone and to treat with some respect. Well, these guys went off and, and they went on their, their great conquests of this whole area. And um, this is uh, Umar. He followed after Abu Bakr. He's the third caliph. And his, his whole um, reign, he begins and he's pushing against what was the Byzantine Empire. The area called the Levant, which would be Palestine, Syria, uh, Jordan today as we would know it. Uh, Israel, Jordan, and uh, Lebanon, that whole area and up into Syria. Um, Egypt, Syros, uh, Phoenicia, um, Tripolitania, Fezzan, Eastern Anatolia, um, parts of the Persian Empire, all of these were annexed to the Islamic Empire. In fact, in his reign, 4,050 cities were taken just by this one guy's reign. By his death in 644, his empire stretched all the way from Libya in the, the western side of things all the way across to India, um, in uh, the river Indus in, uh, in the north of, of India. Well, he's followed by another guy. So after Uthman, you have, or sorry, uh, after Uthman, you have Uthman. Who is he? Umar, sorry. Umar, you have Uthman. And um, he uh, is another sort of uh, a great conqueror, I guess you could say. And um, the last guy was the one who put the Quran together. Um, or this guy was the guy who put the Quran together. And um, he pushes it further from basically into the area of Pakistan as well and across the north of Africa. Um, and um, at the end of his reign, he says, all right, guys, let's take Constantinople. But on his way there, he's assassinated, and that's, that's the end of him. This guy isn't really as interesting other than the fact that he's the fourth caliph. He was um, a descendant of Muhammad, but he was opposed when he was put in place by Muhammad's aging wife, Aisha, and the Umadan tribe 
who basically claimed succession from the last guy, Uthman. Um, he was eventually killed, but out of him, you've heard of the Shiites, right? The Shiite Muslims versus the, uh, the Sunnis. Well, his followers are the Shiites, or the Shias, which means partisans of Allah. And they believe that in order to be the caliph, the ruler, you must be a direct descendant of Muhammad, whereas the Sunnis believe that you must be appointed by somebody from Muhammad's tribe. So that's kind of the, uh, the difference between the two. And you get these Sunnis and Shiites, and they've been fighting ever since. Um, well, that was kind of the end of, of their sort of scene of things around the year 661. Following them would come this Abbasid Empire. It's the second phase, really, of Islam, the golden age of Islam. And uh, it begins around 750 AD in Haran. And it's founded by this dude, Al-Mansur. He's the second of its caliphs. There was a guy before him, but really he's the one who really puts it on its, on its throne. And um, he uh, overthrew the former group of, of different rulers and established his capital in Baghdad. So this is when Baghdad becomes uh, very prominent in uh, the Eastern world. And he stays, or this empire stays in power in Baghdad from the year 750 right the way through to when the Mongols come and sack it in 1258. So quite a period of time. And it's the golden age of Islam. It's uh, the House of Wisdom was established in Baghdad to translate and gather all the world's knowledge into Arabic. And in fact, if it hadn't been for this place, a lot of Western uh, Roman uh, culture and stuff would have been lost because the Romans turned into a bunch of savages, the Middle Ages and whatever else, illiterates, and it was the guys in the East that conserved it all. Kind of like Alexandria was where Alexander the Great collected all the wisdom of the, the Greek world. Baghdad was such a place. And it's the, here that they will be translating works in science and astronomy, alchemy, medicine, mathematics, philosophy. This dude here, um, I hate this guy. Uh, his name is, is uh, Muhammad Ibn Musa al-Khwarizm, or in Arabic, his name is al-Jibra. Um, he invented algebra, so like he's in my bad books. But anyway, he was, he was a great uh, mathematician, and he was from this period. He was a guy that was, was from this period. It's also the time period of the tales of the Arabian Nights. We've all heard of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp, Alibaba and the, the 40 Thieves, the Seven Wonders of Sinbad the Sailor. This is all this time period is this golden age of Islam. But be that as it may, they would continue for a period of time. And their job was, as we've seen, to wipe out the Byzantine Empire, specifically the Catholic presence in this area. And in Revelation chapter 9, it tells you how long that they would exist. The time period is given to you in Revelation chapter 9 and at the fifth verse. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. So they weren't to be the ones that would extinguish. This fifth trumpet wouldn't finish the Byzantine Empire, but they're going to torment it for a period of five months. Their torment was the torment like a scorpion when he strikes a man, as we've seen. And in verse 10, it says their power was to do hurt for a period of five months. So interestingly, these locust forces would last for about five months. When you look at um, Wikipedia, and you say look up locusts, not the greatest source of knowledge, but just as interesting as, as when we looked at this, it says that these locusts that come from this area of Arabia, um, they can't cross t tall mountain ranges. They're not able to do it. They can't fly that high. So it says they won't venture into Central Europe. Um, the adult locusts swarm regularly across the Red Sea between Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. And it says the locusts can live between three and six months. So the language of Revelation is, is factual with what we see in biology. They, they won't adventure into Europe, which they didn't, as far as the, the symbol of the scriptures go, and they only live for a period of about three to six months, which we're told in this case here is five months. Well, interestingly, five months um, is five times 30 days, which is 150 days using the day for a year principle, you have two stages of judgment, 
right? The, the one that was given to us back in uh, the first verse there that we read together, which was verse 5, tormenting for five months. And again, the power in their tails for the second group was for another period of five months. So two stages that would consist of 150 years each. So the first one began with Muhammad in 632 and lasted to 782. That was the period of Islam when it was first born. Then you have the second period of judgment, which is the Abbasid Empire, which began in Baghdad and went from 782 to a period of 933, when it was finished as far as its power. The, the empire still existed, but its power to control the surrounding area ended at that point in time. So when you look at this on a, on a map, um, you see here that basically this furnace opened up, and uh, these, these Persian, or the, these Arabians, came out of this, this area, and they would exist, basically, um, in this whole area in the south, and they would continue for this period of time. Now, what we presented to you, um, and I realize it's history, and there's two parts of this. We're talking about Bible prophecy, you know, that's, that's today. You have to understand this part first, because when we're talking about ISIS and Iran and all this kind of stuff, you know, you listen to the news and you watch YouTube or something like that, and you got every crackpot and their dog on there with some theory about, you know, um, what this all means, right? So, you know, it's easy for us to kind of just follow the trend and, and sort of skim the, the surface and miss the point of the beauty of what's in the scriptures. What we tried to do is give you in this first session, here's the background to this. And in the second one, we're going to look at the four angels of the Euphrates that overflow. Because then we're going to get into the more modern history and then sort of relate it all to what's going in with Iran and ISIS in our third and fourth sessions today. The fourth session being our lecture tonight, which is to do with Russia and Syria and what's all going on in that area right now. But I want you to understand something, that this is what we call, if you want to call it, the traditional Christadelphian point of view. But it's not just a Christadelphian point of view. In fact... Um, if you were to take, there's a book by a guy named Daniel Botkin, uh, it's called Islam and Prophecy. And this is what he says in his book, he says, look, or it's actually, it's an article that he wrote. He says, other commentators agree with this view. And that's the guy there, I love his beard, um, but he has a cool little hat, I've got one just like it, so he's kind of a nice guy. Um, Matthew Henry, you've all heard of Henry's commentary, right? Matthew Henry says... He refers to the army of the locusts as the armies of the Mohammedan Empire. So a lot of people know who Matthew Henry is. You'll hear him quoted in talks. He wrote this huge commentary on the Bible, and he identified and said, hey, drew a line between these two things and said that makes perfect sense. Another guy named Godby, um, who I don't have a photo of. I don't have a photo of the other guy's a painting, but anyway. He says, Revelation 9, um, he says, this chapter is a thrilling description of the rise and the progress of the Mohammedan wars. So he agrees with the same concept as well. Adam Clark, uh, Clark's commentary. Adam Clark says this, John's description of the army of locusts certainly agrees better with the Saracens than any other people or nation and agrees very well with the troops of Muhammad. We have lots of hymns by a guy named Wesley in our hymn book, the beginning of the Methodist group, the, the Wesleyans as they used to be called. He says, all this agrees with the slaughter which the Saracens made for a long time after Muhammad's death. And then you have a guy named Robert Wireland. I don't know him so well, um, but he basically goes on to say that, look, the reformers clearly recognize Islam in this passage. Well into the 19th century, a chorus of Protestants uh, prophetic scholars identified Islam's niche in prophecy as being these fifth and sixth trumpets. John Fox, who wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs, another Protestant, um, he says, it is clear than light itself that this prophecy is of the Muslim conquests, or this is a prophecy of the Muslim conquests. And Albert Barnes, who wrote Barnes' commentary, um, he says, with surprising unanimity, commentators have agreed in regard to this empire of the Saracens or the Arab Muslims and to the rise and the progress of the region and the empire set up by Muhammad. So I think it's fascinating when we look at that and we say, okay, this is the kind of people that 
formed the backdrop of, of Protestant writers for many, many years. They were the ones who were the, they have commented on these things over and over again, and of course a lot of the stuff that they write when it comes to the doctrinal side of things is wrong, um, but their commentary on this, the Protestants protested against Catholicism, and they used the book of Revelation to identify it. But what we've looked at in our first session really has been interesting because it confirms for us what is written in the book of Isaiah. Just open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, God tells us there about himself. Isaiah chapter 46, and this is what he says in verse 9. He says, well, verse 8, he says, I am, and there is none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know... Oh, sorry, uh, what am I am? I'm in the wrong chapter. Uh, 48, that would help. Um, sorry, I'll get there. 46, there we go. Too much highlighting. Okay, chapter 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old, and this is God speaking, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. How does he prove that to us? He says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So one of the ways that God proves his existence to us is to tell us the future before it happens. Revelations written around year 80, 96. The events we've looked at were from 600 plus through to approximately um, 900 or so thereabouts. All declared in great graphic detail, right down to the turbans they would wear on their heads, how they would cut their hair and shave their beards. Like this is the identification God gives to us. So we can have confidence in this, and when we look at these things, to realize that our God does declare the end from the beginning. Now God willing, in our next session, what we hope to do is take a look at the angels that overflow the river Euphrates. The reason it's important to take a look at them is because when we get to our time period, because we live in the time period of the sixth vial, it's talking about the river Euphrates drying up. The context of that is them first overflowing. So we'll spend some time in our next session looking at that, God willing.